Hello, everybody. Welcome to Book Club with uh, Jeffrey Sachs. And uh, today, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be speaking with uh, a dear colleague and uh, one of the uh, great historians of our time, uh, Professor Eric Foner of Columbia University. And we're talking about his recent book, uh, The Second Founding. And it's a, a fabulous book. Uh, the subtitle is How the Civil War and Reconstruction Remade the Constitution. Uh, and uh, it is uh, a, a fascinating historical account, but absolutely pressing for us today because uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Eric uh, whether we're in the third founding or not, whether we need to be, uh, but uh, certainly the the lessons in the history of the second founding uh, continue to shape uh, American society in, in an extraordinary way. So Eric, thank you so much for, for uh, being uh, together uh, with me in this discussion. Uh, could I ask you a, a general open question? What is the second founding? Why uh, did America need a second founding? And uh, how have you uh, framed that in, in this book? And just to say for everybody listening in, uh, Professor Foner is our great, greatest authority on this period uh, of American history. Uh, and so listen carefully and uh, enjoy and learn. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, the second founding, uh, the title is meant to sort of juxtapose the three the three constitutional amendments that were uh, adopted right after the Civil War during the Reconstruction period, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, which we will go into in more detail, uh, juxtapose that with what we call the founding, the founding fathers, the uh, writing of the Constitution in the late uh, 1780s, the uh, establishment of a national government after uh, independence, uh, and um, why did we need a second founding? Well, the fundamental reason is the Civil War, which upended the regime which had existed since uh, the uh, adoption of the Constitution. And uh, we, we needed to come to terms with the consequences of the Civil War, the most important of which were the preservation of the national state and the destruction of the institution of slavery. The original Constitution had... Um, at least one might say, recognized and protected the existence of slavery in the United States. Uh, the word slavery doesn't appear in the original constitution, but through circumlocutions, such as three-fifths of other persons or persons held to labor, uh, terms like that, uh, the institution uh, received significant protection uh, in the constitution. With the destruction of slavery, all that was gone, uh, to use a modern term, which perhaps is a little out of style right this minute, uh, what we're seeing here is regime change. That is to say the transformation of a pro-slavery regime, which was created uh, in, 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 as a result of the American Revolution, into one uh, that not only was based on the end of slavery, but on an attempt to create genuine equality, uh, interracial equality in this country uh, for the first time. So um, the, one of the main points of my book is the constitution we live with today is the constitution of the second founding. It's not the original constitution. The second founding uh, fundamentally transformed our constitutional system, our legal system, our political system. Uh, it, it, these amendments were not just uh, minor changes in an existing structure. Uh, so um, you know, so that's, but the problem is that most people probably wouldn't realize that. The uh, framers of the original constitution are widely known and respected. James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, of course, he got a boost from a Broadway musical. Um, George Washington, of course, who presided over the constitutional convention. The architects of the amendments of reconstruction are hardly household names. James Ashley, uh, Henry Wilson, uh, John Bingham, particularly with the 14th Amendment. Um, most people don't know who they are, and yet they are just as essential to our constitutional order as the founders uh, right after the revolution. 
So Eric, maybe uh, your your next uh, work will be a, a good musical with a good rap between Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner. Uh, about, uh, about I think these that amendments. would be. I think that would be great. I haven't had a call yet to uh, <laughs> take part in that, but I'm ready anytime. What's what's fascinating and uh, what comes through very clearly, we know that the Civil War reshaped uh, both the laws, culture. Uh, about race in the U.S., but also uh, what the book makes very clear is that uh, the Civil War fundamentally reshaped the uh, relative roles of the federal government and the state governments, uh, which was also a hugely uh, complex uh, part of the birth of, of the United States, how to put together 13 distinct culturally uh, different uh, colonies into one country, what's the balance between a federal government and a state government? We'll go into that, but uh, you describe how much the issues of states' rights versus federal rights predominate, and we're still debating that question, uh, actually, literally, uh, in these days. But I wanted to ask you, Eric, before we get to the amendments themselves, America's founded on uh, a a verbal sleight of hand that also reflects a, a profound complexity and ambivalence. The, the founding uh, credo is that all men are created equal uh, and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and yet, this was a slave country for uh, much of the country, and that remained central to the economy of the whole nation uh, and to uh, the uh, certainly uh, everything about politics and the social structure up to and, and after the Civil War and arguably until today. Could you just say you've been thinking about this for, uh, for, for decades <laughs> and writing great books about this? How, are, how were these two views held in the mind of American political leaders from the founding fathers onward? Because at the one moment that they would say all men are created equal, they were slaveholders themselves. So can you say something about the mindset? Is that an easy answer or is that a complicated answer or is that cognitive dissonance? Because it is a kind of amazing feature of the country. Yeah, well, of course, you're right. I mean, I'd say <laughs> it wasn't it was a real ambivalence in that many, not all, of course, but many of the people who made the American Revolution and who made the Constitution uh, understood that slavery stood in contradiction to the uh, ideals that were being put forward, particularly in the Declaration of Independence. Some states took action during the revolution to put slavery on what Lincoln would later call the road to ultimate extinction. Pennsylvania passed a gradual emancipation law in 1780. Uh, Massachusetts, it was even quicker that the, the uh, court judgments just basically outlawed slavery. Uh, but on the other hand, there were plenty of uh, states in the North. Every, uh, every one of the 13 states had slavery when the revolution began. Some of them moved in the next 15, 20 years to abolish slavery, but the places where slavery was most deeply embedded in the economy, the plantation states from Maryland southward down to Georgia, uh, they had no interest in getting rid of slavery. And indeed, as you said, slavery was the foundation of their economy. And I think people like, let us take Alexander Hamilton, who spoke against slavery on occasion, um, that was not a main priority to him. His priority was nation building. And he understood right away, if you went to, if you directly attack slavery, you would never get a unified nation. Uh, it, this had happened at the time of the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson had included a condemnation of slavery in the original draft, although it was a little dishonest because he blamed George III for slavery, not the colonists themselves. But nonetheless, but South Carolina and Georgia said, well, forget it, we're not signing on to anything which includes a condemnation of slavery. So then you had to choose, do we stick with our principles or do we try to create a unified nation? They always chose the latter. In other words, anti-slavery 
was not their number one priority, even for those who criticized slavery. There were other priorities which took precedence, and that's why you get a constitution which doesn't mention slavery, but certainly has deep protections for slavery. Uh, and indeed, through the three-fifths clause, gives the South far greater political power than it should have had uh, by counting three-fifths of the slave population when apportioning members of Congress, electoral votes, uh, et cetera. And, you know, from the revolution to the Civil War, just about every president was a slave owner. Not every single one, but almost every single one. Um, those were the people who were running the country. So whatever the intellectual contradiction, slavery expanded, it was thriving, it was the source of much of American economic growth in the first half of the 19th century. And um, to get rid of it became more and more impossible, basically. It became more and more entrenched. Some of the founders thought slavery might die out. It wasn't dying out. It was strong. It was thriving. Yep. In 1860, there were more slaves in the United States than at any other point in our history. It was growing. It was not dying out. And sad to say, I'm not a violent person. No one has ever suggested to me a plausible way of getting rid of slavery without war. I was going to ask you about that. Uh, the U.S., I don't know if it's fair to say or right to say the U.S. is the only country that had to, had to have a brutal civil war to end slavery. Uh, I wouldn't say that. Slavery- They wouldn't put it that way. It's never peaceful. Different kinds of war, different kinds of, uh, uh, you know, of conflicts. The wars of the uh, Latin American liberation in the first part of the uh, 19th century led directly to the end of slavery in many parts of Latin America. The Cuban war for independence in the 1870s, 80s led to the end of slavery in Cuba. In other words, um, yes, the United States had a bigger war other than Haiti, where you had a slave insurrection. Um, but that's because slavery in the United States was far bigger than anywhere else. You know, there were... Um, there were about 6 million slaves in the Western Hemisphere uh, in 1860. 4 million of them were in the United States. Slavery yeah. in the United States dwarfed that in any other. Indeed, you have to go back to ancient Rome to find a slave system as, as gigantic and important as the American slave system leading up to the Civil War. So I always wondered, uh, Britain ended slavery in the British Empire in 1833, I think, or 1834. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, also to my amazement, uh, the, the Tsar Alexander uh, II uh, uh, liberated the serfs uh, at the same time as uh, the US Civil War, uh, right. both peacefully, uh, but you're just not as entrenched uh, in, 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 in I mean, in, in Russia, it is actually pretty surprising that he pulled that well, off. Well, but it, liberating the serfs wasn't quite the same thing as freeing slaves. Uh, uh, they remained uh, in many ways tied to the land and connected to their former owners. I'm not trying to denigrate that. That was a tremendous step forward for Russia. The British abolition, of course, applied to the British Empire. In other words, slavery was not embedded in the society of England. Yeah. There were many people there who profited from slavery, of course, but you didn't have freeing the slaves in the British West Indies did not mean you were creating a not large new class of former slaves, as happened in the United States. And what was going to be the status of those people? That was the key question that came out of the Civil War and that the second founding tries to address. What about these four million slaves? Are they citizens? Are they going to have the same rights as uh, the other Americans? Uh, what about the legacy of slavery? How can the country deal with that? Um, those problems didn't quite arise in the same way in Britain or these other uh, imperial uh, countries where slavery was out in the colonies, not in the uh, homeland. And, and it, it is fair to say that uh, during the Civil War itself, uh, these issues were not in the forefront uh, in the sense that probably, well, even the idea whether this was a war that would end slavery was far from clear during much of the war itself. 
uh, and Lincoln it, took it, a yeah, very... It, uh, it became clearer and clearer as the war went on. Of course, as everybody knows, when the war began, Lincoln said, this war is to preserve the Union. It is not to attack slavery. Uh, at the very, very beginning, many Union generals would send fugitive slaves back to their owners. They ran away to seek freedom with the Union army, and uh, but that quickly stopped. And, you know, even though it was not the official stance of the government to abolish slavery, slavery began to weaken almost from the beginning of the war. And the Lincoln administration began taking steps slowly, small scale, then bigger, and then, you know, by 1862, Congress abolished slavery in the District of Columbia, abolished slavery in the territories uh, quickly, but in the Confiscation Acts, freed slaves of Confederate owners uh, who were behind Union lines and things like that. So the, the attack on slavery begins maybe a little earlier than a lot of historians have suggested, but that the main point really is that the slaves themselves took the initiative. Thousands ran away to Union lines. They stopped acting as if they were slaves. They understood that the presence of the Union Army completely changed the balance of power in their neighborhoods uh, in the South. And they, in a sense, the, the running away of slaves uh, forced the issue onto the national agenda as the Civil War went, went on. And, and indeed, um, running away to the Union lines and then to enlist and to fight uh, incredibly valiantly in, in the Civil War itself. Yeah, well, Lincoln, in the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln authorized the enrollment of African-American men, former slaves, uh, as combat soldiers. They had worked earlier as like, uh, you know, transportation people in the, in the army as uh, quartermaster or even the digging, you know, fortifications and all this. But now they were going to be combat soldiers, which was an astonishing thing given how big slavery was and how frightened owners were of the prospect or the specter of a slave insurrection to arm former slaves to fight their former owners. Um, you know, Karl Marx, who was living in London at this time um, and writing for the New York Tribune, uh, he <laughs> said with the Emancipation Proclamation- A good stringer, huh? Yeah, we, he said, up to now, we have had the constitutional waging of war. Now we are embarking on the revolutionary waging of war. Slavery a target, black men armed, a completely different situation than at the beginning of the war. So that brings us to, uh, to, to the founding of the second founding. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like us, uh, everybody to understand uh, these three amendments because they're, they're not uh, a logical package that they're uh, just laid before the nation. Okay, now here's what we do. They are a remarkable, remarkable political battle and uh, improvisation, negotiation. Can you uh, take us yes. through the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments? Right. Well, the, th the 13th Amendment seems to be the most straightforward, that Slavery can, it, this abolishes slavery irrevocably through the entire country. The Emancipation Proclamation had freed many slaves, but there were many slaves who were not covered by it for one reason or another. Uh, the 13th Amendment is the final nail in the coffin of slavery. And um, it, uh, you know, it's a remarkable, it, it, as, as an economist, you'll, you'll understand, you know, you don't think of it this way, but among other things, it, it is the uncompensated abrogation of the largest concentration of property in the country. Slaves as property were worth more than all the banks, factories, and railroads put together. Wow. And, and that property is just abrogated. There is never going to be any compensation for the loss of that property. or That doesn't happen in history very often, actually. Um, but... The 13th Amendment raised big questions, which it didn't answer. The most important is, what, well, what, come, what does it mean to actually abolish slavery? Does that mean that, the, that Black people will now no longer have all the, uh, all the restrictions that existed under slavery? For example, 
it was illegal to, to, for a slave to learn before the Civil War, right? You couldn't, they couldn't be taught to read and write. Well, does the abolition of slavery therefore mean the government has an obligation to provide education to them as part of the abolition of slavery? Um, you know, and questions like that. Slavery, as one uh, congressman said, was the sum of all iniquities. Every, every right was violated by slavery. Did the abolition of slavery therefore mean that all those rights the right to vote, the right to hold office, the right to have economic advancement were now guaranteed by the government. Well, of course, there was tremendous disagreement about that. Um, so the, maybe, the, maybe really it's the a, question uh, that is, is what does it mean to be a free American in the aftermath of the Civil War? So the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery and but it raises all these other questions. And as you suggested, that this becomes the focus of a really titanic struggle between the president, Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln after Lincoln's assassination. He had been the vice president, who was a deeply racist uh, Southerner who really had no interest in protecting the rights of the former slaves at all. And a, a gigantic contest between him and the members of Congress, the Republicans controlled Congress, um, but, and um, you know, they did very quickly, they realized Johnson's plan of reconstruction was to put blacks pretty close back to a status of slavery almost. Um, and out of that in 1866 comes the 14th amendment which in a sense tries to answer the question, okay, what are the rights now that every American is supposed to have, not just the former slaves? 14th Amendment doesn't say anything about race. It's race neutral. It applies, but of course, the former slaves are the ones on their mind, but it applies to all Americans, uh, not just uh, black Americans. And, um, and what's fascinating in your discussion is uh, the realization that the question of what it means to be an American citizen was never sorted out in the period from the Constitution up through, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and also, uh, I, I guess, a, a fundamental point uh, is that citizenship up until this moment was uh, at, at most about citizenship in states, uh, not a national citizen, not a citizen of the United States uh, yeah, in some it, sense. It, yeah, that, that's quite right, of course. Um, citizenship was, de was determined by the individual states. Uh, there was a general assumption that if you were born in the United States, you're a citizen. If you're white, the Supreme Court in the Tred Scott decision right before the Civil War said, well, black people can never be citizens. It doesn't matter if they're born free, if they've been here, their parents for, you know, their families for generations. Citizenships is for white Americans only. And that's you know one of the indications of how slavery sort of warped the whole uh, understanding of American nationality. This is a country for white men was the, a very popular political slogan at that time. 14th Amendment begins with the words, basically, anybody born in the United States is a citizen. It sweeps away the Dred Scott decision. This is what we call birthright citizenship. And of course, it's still hotly controversial today. Then it goes on to say that no state can deny to any citizen the privileges and immunities of citizenship. But it doesn't say what those are. Right. That's for future Congresses. But now all these citizens are supposed to have the same privileges and immunities. And then it, this is all the first section. And then it goes on to say, here are at least a few of the rights. No person, not just citizen, person, anybody in the country, aliens included, can be denied by a state um, the equal protection of the law. Equal protection, that puts the concept of equality into the Constitution for the first time. The Declaration of Independence had said all men are created equal, but the Constitution didn't use the word equal or equality, except in a sort of technical thing about what happens if you get this, if two candidates get the same number of electoral votes. But um, the idea that the Constitution protects equality among American citizenship, uh, among American citizens is didn't exist before the Civil War. 
it did exist among the abolitionist movement. What you're seeing here is ideals that have been put forward by anti-slavery activists before the war and by African-Americans themselves, birthright, citizenship, equality before the law, all those things which didn't exist before the Civil War now are put into the Constitution. Let me very quickly add that the 14th Amendment is like the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, it's always relevant. Citizenship, we're debating that today. Right to vote, it sort of contains a complicated compromise, not giving Black men the right to vote, but penalizing states that don't give Black men the right to vote. Section two. And by the way, this has never been enforced and in my opinion should be enforced. If a state denies to any group of men, and today that would, it would be anybody because women now have the right to vote. If a state denies to any citizen the right to vote, that state will lose some of its representation in Congress. So for example, let's say Alabama was 50% black, 50% white before the, at the time of reconstruction. If Alabama gave black men the right to vote, no problem. They'd have the same number of congressmen as always. If they said, no, only white men can vote, then they lose half their congressmen because blacks are half the... Now, this has never been enforced. Right now, states are, as we all know, trying to deny people the right to vote, trying to limit the right to vote. Um, shouldn't Texas lose a couple of congressmen if the number of people disenfranchised by their new laws gets up to a certain proportion. As I say, Congress has never enforced it, the courts have never enforced it, but it's out there uh, and uh, might not be a bad idea to look at it again. I hope uh, some lawyers are listening in. Uh, this sounds like a good <laughs> a good opportunity. But members, as you say, uh, Pelosi, that, 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 the Speaker of the House is listening in. But um, then you go to the third section of the 14th Amendment, and that also has relevance. Anybody who took an oath to support the Constitution and then basically engaged in insurrection or gave aid to insurrection is forever barred from office, not from uh -huh. holding office. <laughs> You can there think of those. a few candidates for that, right? Well, I wrote an op-ed about this. A few did back in January. We have a president. We had a president who certainly took an oath to support the Constitution, and then at the end of his term, encouraged insurrection. Let us say, um, shouldn't he be disqualified from holding office? That's a diff. That's not impeachment. This is a different yep. mode in the Constitution. Mostly at that time, it was to prevent ex-Confederate leaders from getting back into political uh, power. And then there's the fourth section. You might find this interesting. No, no jurisprudence on this, but it's also sitting here. Um, it deals with a, a bunch of economic issues. For example, there'll never be compensation for the loss of slaves. Southerners who bought Confederate bonds, who loaned money to the Confederate government in a patriotic gesture, will never get their yeah. money back. Those bonds are no longer valid. And the strange wording, the national debt of the United States cannot be questioned. What about right now? They're debating whether to raise the debt limit. Debt limit. The possibility of the government defaulting on unconstitutional. Its, on, right. President Biden could just raise the debt limit by himself, in my opinion. The Constitution says you cannot have a default on the bonds of the United States. Pelosi, where are you? You've got to remember this. <laughs> All right. These but are the good. The point of this actually is, and then the fifth section finally says that. Congress will have the power to enforce this, not the states, not the courts. Congress will have, in fact, all three amendments end with that, that clause. Congress will have the power to enforce it. And this goes back to your point, Jeff, about federalism. This is a tremendous increase in the power of the federal government as opposed to the states. The original Bill of Rights was based on limiting the federal government. Congress shall make no law ab abridging the freedom of speech. That's the First Amendment. Now it's the states that are prohibited from violating the rights of citizens. 
and Congress shall have the power to enforce the uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So it's a fundamental change in the federal system. And a lot of people don't, in this world of jurisprudence, of courts, don't quite realize that. When they try, if you look at Supreme Court decisions, when they talk about federalism, they go back to the original Constitution. States' rights, all that. They do not talk about how the Constitution changed. Was refounded. Yeah, was refounded, and the whole balance of power within it was shifted by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Which, which Let me made sense finally... after, after having had a civil war, after all, yeah, where exactly. states had seceded. So let's uh, qu uh, quickly uh, uh, yeah. move to the, maybe the most contentious of all of them, the, the 15th Amendment. Yeah. Well, that comes back down to the right to vote. The, as I said, the 14th Amendment didn't give anybody the right to vote, although it had a penalty to states that denied any group of men the right to vote. Voting has always been under the control of the states in this country, and it still is in many ways. We do not have a national set of criteria for voting. We have 50 different laws and regulations. You can move from one state to another and lose your right to vote just because you've gone to another state. What we have in the Constitution is way of barring certain ways of limiting the right to vote. So 15th Amendment says no state can deny to anybody the right to vote because of race. It doesn't say who has the right to vote, but it says you can't deny them the right to vote because of race. And your you can deny them the right to vote on other grounds without violating. And in fact, you know, that's what happened in the late 19th century when the Southern states began to take away the right to vote from African-American men they didn't do it by passing a law saying, hey, black people can no longer vote because that would violate the 15th Amendment. They did it through poll taxes. They did it through understanding clauses. They did it through literacy tests, ostensibly non-racial. Well, this applies to everyone. There's no, but in fact, of course, the way they were implemented was completely uh, biased. Um, so, and, and Eric, you make the point uh, very vividly and as you're making it right now that there were actually two versions of the 15th Amendment proposed. One said you cannot bar voting on the basis of race, and the other saying you must, we must have voting on the following uh, criteria, all yeah. uh, adult males and so forth. And the positive variant was put aside, so we never defined what was the right to vote, just what could not be done ostensibly. Yeah, I, I, the radical Republicans wanted a positive statement. Now, again, unfortunately, at this time, no, hardly any members of Congress wanted to give women the right to vote. So all of these proposals are for men. To the great annoyance and alarm of the women's suffrage movement at this time, which protested bitterly that Black men were getting the right to vote, but women, Black and white, were being denied. Um, so, uh, but yes, yeah, so, but, so the radicals wanted a positive statement. All adult male citizens have the right to vote. That would have solved a lot of problems going forward. But the problem is Northern states wanted to keep control of the right to vote for themselves. My colleague, uh, May Nye, has just published an excellent book on, uh, about the prejudices uh, against the Chinese on the West Coast in this period. California, in fact, refused to ratify the 15th Amendment because they were afraid it would give Chinese men the right to vote, which had been barred in, Calif in, in California. Um, Rhode Island had a separate qualification for voting for immigrants as opposed to native-born citizens. They didn't want to give that up. Uh, so this notion of states' rights, of state control over voting requirements, uh, doomed the positive 15th Amendment and still is out there today, as we see. State after state are passing their own laws, limiting the right to vote, and claiming that they're not racially biased. Now, of course, laws and amendments, the courts have sometimes ruled that these things actually are intended to stop minorities from voting, 
But in fact, again, again what the, all the Constitution says about voting is you can't do this, you can't, you, you can't deny it now because of sex as well as race. You can't require a poll tax. Um, but that doesn't positively say what other qualifications are legitimate in regulating the right to vote. So if there's one- So after- Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say that uh, this is an incredible drama and beautifully uh, told and really uh, uh, fascinating to watch uh, these amendments to work their way through. And also to remind everybody in the US system, uh, you need two thirds vote in each of the houses of Congress, and then you need three fourths of the states to ratify. So it's a very complex process with the uh, profound politics at every stage. But these three great amendments uh, are passed. And then this story turns dark again, uh, turns sour. Uh, and you describe uh, vividly uh, from the optic of the courts, how these amendments are then interpreted. And one can talk about the reality on the ground as well after the end of the federal occupation of the Southern states in 1877 uh, and the building of the new apartheid or Jim Crow uh, societies, uh, especially in the US South, but with plenty of racism of all kinds to go around in the United States after that. Right. Can you can you give us a, a big picture briefly? It's, of course, a huge story of the next, uh, in, in a way, the next hundred years of America. But uh, this yes. this edifice is then profoundly uh, undermined, uh, maligned, uh, limited, narrowed, uh, worked around uh, in, in uh, very deep ways. Yes, sadly, uh, that is correct. Um, we shouldn't forget, though, that because of these amendments, a period of genuine interracial democracy took place in the South and in the whole nation, radical reconstruction or whatever you call it, where for the first time in American history, this is in the late 1860s and into the 1870s, Black men in large numbers voted for the first time, held office, hundreds, if not a few thousand Black men were now part of the body politic. Um, and it really changed Southern life temporarily. Uh, but the fact is, as you say, that over time- And, and created uh, some wonderful reforms, like the first school systems in the right, Southern states, yes. which is school, amazing. First time you had public school, state-supported public school systems in just about all the Southern states. But as the phrase goes, the Constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. And- all these amendments left open points of interpretation. As I said before, what comes along with the abolition of slavery? Um, the court said not much. This, that this, the, the 13th Amendment, its purpose was fulfilled when it was ratified. No more slavery, that's it. We don't want to hear about any other rights about coming out of this, etc. What about the 14th Amendment? Uh, what are the privileges and immunities of citizens? Court said, slaughterhouse case, mm, there really aren't very many. Just about all your rights come from the states, not the federal government. Uh, the, the, the 14th Amendment didn't really change that. What about equal protection of the law? That doesn't define itself. Someone has to, well, of course, by the end of the 19th century, state mandated racial segregation was viewed by the Supreme Court as not a violation of equal protection, as long as these uh, facilities, institutions were separate but equal. Of course, they never were equal, but the court sort of turned a blind eye uh, to that. Um, what a, so, you know, one can go down all of these um, ambiguous statements that cried out for interpretation and see how the court always uh, basically adopted a narrow, very narrow view of them. Finally, the 15th Amendment, as I said, by the, e by the end of the 19th century, Southern states had pretty much abrogated the right to vote for black men. Supreme Court said, well, in one of the, Giles v. Harris, one of their worst decisions, basically they said, you know, if the white people of Alabama want to disenfranchise all the black people, there is nothing we can do about it. They just threw up their hands. The Constitution simply cannot be enforced. Uh, 
uh, in in the South, and um, it took it's a, a long, stun- long yeah. time. One really best, a, yeah, a, it, a stunning thing that the court just said. Well, that's the way it is. It, it, it was even worse in a way because they said it's for the people of Alabama to decide these matters. But half of the people of Alabama had been eliminated from the discussion. That was the whole point of the debate was who are the people of Alabama? Is it just the white people or is it everybody? And the court just threw that, didn't even notice that that was uh, a part of the, they were accepting the idea that it's the white people who determine these things, not the whole uh, population of Alabama. Uh, and then one other very important question, which is relevant, all these things are relevant today. The 14th Amendment says no state can deny you this, that, or the other thing. What about private individuals? Does the federal government, what about mobs, clansmen, uh, lynchers? Can they, can the federal government go after them? Well, the court eventually said no, because this is what they call the state action doctrine, that it's, it's only bars official acts by the state governments or, to, uh, or public officials that are discriminatory, not individual, uh, you know, individuals, even if they commit murder and things like that, that's not a federal uh, offense. Uh, in other words, you create, it's another weird thing. You create this edifice of constitutional rights, and then you step back and say, well, if violent individuals make it impossible for people to exercise these rights, there's nothing the federal government can do about that. That's a very strange kind of constitutional right that can be taken away from you by another citizen with a gun, you know? Um, it, it is it is stunning, and, and I, I want to turn to... Uh, this point that uh, the backdrop to all of this was, uh, or a foundation of it, is that the tremendous amount of racism at the core of American culture, uh, or large parts of American culture. So whether it's the Supreme Court saying we can't do anything about it, or indeed uh, the Southern states finding their ways around all of this, uh, in in the end, the, the racism, not the slavery returning, but the racism proved to uh, absolutely be able to shape the real life, the real politics, and the, the real economics. But interestingly, also, it shaped academia. Uh, and you discuss this, and uh, it, it's a stunning thing, but uh, I, I'd like to talk about how this whole period was understood uh, by uh, one of your f- famous predecessors at Columbia University, <laughs> William uh, Dunning. Um, and if I am, am correct in understanding this, the Dunning school or the Dunning interpretation of, uh, of the reconstruction period when there was the period of multiracial open democracy was to say, what a horrible uh, experience that was for America. Thank God we went back to a white-led society. And that was uh, be, that became the historiography for yeah. uh, at least the first half of the 20th century. Yeah, uh, uh, sadly, that is, of course, correct. Um, the Dunning School, in a nutshell, just said, look, giving Black men the right to vote was the worst decision in the history of American democracy, black people are just inherently incapable of uh, taking part intelligently in democratic politics. And therefore the ones, the Klansmen and others who eventually overthrew these democratic governments by violence, uh, you know, they, they were doing the right thing. Uh, so, so you, in other words, the, the, it was completely rejected as a model the, the notion of uh, interracial uh, political uh, democracy. And that view dominated for a long, long time. It, it, these books were written in the early 20th century, but way down into the 1950s, uh, this was the dominant view among academic scholars, as you, as you say, as well as the large part of the just sort of general, uh, general public interested in history. And this had a powerful political effect. It's not just an academic debate over interpretation of this or that. The message was clear. Uh, 
the white South had the right to deny black people the right to vote. And if the outside, the rest of the country kind of forced them to make good on the idea of democracy, you'd have a replay of the so-called horrors of Reconstruction. So this academic interpretation was part of the intellectual legitimacy of the Jim Crow system as it existed in the South for a good chunk of the 20th century. And it was adopted by the courts. Uh, into the 1950s and 60s, court decisions about the amendments would often cite the works of the Dunning School in order to suggest what was wow. going on in Reconstruction. As late as 2004, that's not that long ago, Chief Justice Rehnquist published a book about the, uh, about the election of 1876, the disputed election which ended Reconstruction. And um, in the course of that book, he sort of said, you know, Reconstruction was a disaster. It was a Carthaginian peace. That is the North just, um, uh, you know, imposing its will on the South, running amok, destroying things. And um, if you have that attitude, that Shame. that's what's going on in Reconstruction, you're not going to have a very uh, expansive view of what the Reconstruction amendments were meant to achieve. When we went into lockdown and suddenly uh, uh, there was a, a bit more time for reading, one of the first things that I read, uh, I think I'd mentioned it to you, was uh, Du Bois Black Reconstruction. Yes. Oh my God. It was one of the most moving experiences of uh, my intellectual life, I would say. But am I right? It, it was this great uh, historian, I think the first uh, African-American to get a PhD in, in Harvard history department. Uh, but he almost single-handedly, because he was only the only one, took on this dominant historiography. And this 1935 book is unbelievably brilliant and captivating. It's a great book. Yeah, you're completely right about that. It's a great book. And it did completely dismantle the old Dunning School uh, mythologies. But unfortunately, it had little impact in the mainstream universities. It was fairly widely read, actually, in the 30s when it was published. And it certainly was read in the Black colleges. But it didn't affect how Reconstruction was taught in most of the major universities uh, in the country. That wouldn't come until the 1960s. It was the Civil Rights Revolution sometimes called the Second Reconstruction, which not only dismantled finally the Jim Crow system, but also, um, you know, also said that this is not, it, a, a historical interpretation based on overt racism is no longer tenable nowadays. And Reconstruction was completely reinterpreted starting in the 1960s and it's going on today. There's good work being done on Reconstruction. And uh, so Du Bois, yes, led the way, but it wasn't until a generation mm -hmm. later that, that, that the perspective that he was putting forward, which saw Reconstruction as a major moment in the history of American democracy and the tragedy being not that it was attempted, but that it failed, uh, it, 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 now that is widely believed in the academic world, but it took quite a long time for people to catch up with Du Bois. One of the fascinating things that I think about academia and about history is the question, who gets to write it? Uh, so, you know, when Du Bois wrote, he was a lone voice, an incredibly brilliant voice. And one of the wonderful things about uh, history today is that it's being written by people who a generation ago wouldn't have had the standing to uh, to write wouldn't have been allowed to write, so to speak, uh, whether it's women or Native Americans or African Americans or other minorities. And it seems incredibly enriching and fascinating to see, to have the story told in a different way <laughs> by, by those who suffered and never had the right to to express this alternative point of view. Yeah, no, you're completely right. Um, it, it, we shouldn't, though, ignore the black colleges. Up until the 60s, when integration took place, and I'm not just talking about the South, Columbia University had no black students virtually until the mid to late 1960s. Uh, 
uh, and barely any black faculty. I was an undergraduate and graduate student at Columbia. I never had a black teacher in any course. I never had a woman teacher in a history course in my whole life. Um, you know, the, so the, the, the cast of characters of the profession, the demography of the profession has changed enormously. Not that all those people agree with each other. There's the usual academic disagreement and changing of ideas. But it's a much more diverse group of people who are trying to come to terms with American history. And as you know, that's also controversial. Uh, well, it are... seems to me that this is the essence of this fight over 1619 and critical race theory and all the rest is ultimately the opponents of it, like Mitch McConnell and others who say, why are you stirring all of this up? It's really not about the substance. It's about who do you think you are to tell this story? We already told that story. Yeah, I don't think we want Mitch McConnell determining what is taught in every uh, classroom in the country. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that the, the redefinition of American history in a more critical direction uh, has alarmed a lot of people who want a patriotic uplifting history. They want a history where things begin perfect and then they get better and better, you know? Uh, but uh, so, um, you know, there's problems with the 1619 Project, just like any other thing produced by human beings. But I think it, it much of what's in there by historians is now, is pretty much what most historians think. I mean, it, it's, there's not that many surprises in there to historians, to the general public, which hasn't been following uh, changes in historical interpretation, uh, there may be some who find this project, uh, you know, difficult to, um, uh, to swallow, so to speak. Um, but now we're at the point where states, as you know, are passing laws outlawing the teaching of racism in the classroom. Uh, well, you know, it's sort of like the scope, we may be heading back to the scopes trial of the 1920s. Then it was evolution, which was banned. I, we may see a teacher thrown in jail for mentioning the history of American racism. You know, that's what the laws that have been passed in several states seem to uh, seem to suggest. And that doesn't seem to be a very healthy thing uh, for a, you know, a thriving uh, uh, historical consciousness. But when, when uh, one reads all of your great books, Eric, it, it does seem that this is one of the, the fundamental truths of the United States. We are always at culture war, if not at hot war. We're always heatedly debating because diversity is extraordinarily hard to manage. It is. And the ideals which are at the root of the American founding, perhaps, at least part of it, of equality, of liberty, et cetera, are always up for grabs. They're not defined in any highly clear way. They are always contested and groups and individuals are always seeking more equality and more liberty. And so these debates are endless and they should be endless because we're not, even though the second founding was a tremendous turning point in our political legal system, we're not locked into the world of the 1860s, you know? Uh, we have to apply those ideals to today and see how they, you know, uh, what they demand of us, not to go back to the debates between Andrew Johnson and Thaddeus Stevens, which are very important historically, but don't really <laughs> give us a blueprint for action uh, in 2021. What one of the, uh, the another uh, history that I read during our lockdown heavy reading uh, period was uh, we'll, uh, have be, you, we'll have to give you we have to get you a test on these books. Of good, history. absolutely. I'll I'll be in seed by uh, another colleague uh, historian of yours, uh, David Hackett Fisher. What a brilliant book! Yeah. But one of the things that he emphasizes uh, this is a cultural history of the United States arguing that uh, we have very distinct British cultures in America. We think of us as having the, the British cultural ancestry, but he points out they're very distinct, whether they're Anglican or Puritan or Quaker uh, or, uh, or uh, high country uh, 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 and back country uh, traditions uh, of the e evangelicalism. Uh, 
But the words like liberty, freedom, equality mean such different things in the cultural contexts as well. So we debate the words themselves uh, in such fundamental ways. Yes. Well, on, today, it seems a lot of people have expanded the idea of freedom to include the right to infect other people with a exactly. deadly Exactly. You know? So it's... Uh, exactly. It's freedom, at least uh, liberty, according to uh, the great libertarian John Stuart Mill, does not mean the liberty to harm others. Uh, and that uh, seems to be a, a missing element in part of our public discussion. Yeah, Fred. So. Eric, this is a, a absolutely phenomenal work, so important, so uh, well told, and so fascinating. Uh, let me uh, encourage everybody to read the second founding. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, it, uh, for such a fantastic discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the next book club, let me invite you to. Uh, a, a, another historian uh, and philosopher, Corey Robin, who will be speaking about his book uh, and will be discussing with him the reactionary mind, conservatism from Edmund Burke to Donald Trump. Uh, that will be on October 26th uh, at uh, 1700 hours UTC. So uh, we will have uh, two wonderful books uh, in a row. Uh, please uh, join me in, in thanking uh, Eric Foner for uh, this marvelous discussion and, and this great book. Eric, thank you so much for, for being here today. Thank you for having me today. Wonderful. Thanks a lot.